In the next lecture, we will talk about perhaps the most influential philosopher of history ever, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Now, Hegel claimed that to understand something, whether it is an idea or a person or a society, you have to know its history. Everything can only be understood when placed in its historical context. So it seems only fitting that before we start to talk about Hegel, we will first talk about the time of Hegel and about how that time, the early 19th century, differed intellectually from what came before. And this is especially important in these lectures on history, because the early 19th century saw the development of a radical new ideas about history and about the importance of history. So let us start with the 18th century, which is often called the Age of Enlightenment or the Age of Reason. Obviously, reducing an entire century to just one name or one concept means that we will have to leave out much of the fascinating detail and diversity of history. But in this lecture, we will focus on these very broad lines. So, what exactly does it mean to call the 18th century the Age of Enlightenment? What is Enlightenment? That is a question that the greatest of all 18th century philosophers, Immanuel Kant, asked himself in an article called What is Enlightenment? And Kant answered that enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. To become enlightened then is to become a mature person. And when Kant talks about maturity, he means the ability to use your own understanding without guidance from other people. In other words, he means the ability to think for yourself. To be enlightened is to be able to think for yourself. But you might wonder, isn't it true that all people can think for themselves? Well, yes. But according to many thinkers of the 18th century, most people rarely do so. Most people are not ruled by their own reason, but by prejudices, by what they've been taught, by other people's ideas. They don't think for themselves. They just believe what their neighbors believe or what the church tells them to believe. So the project of the Enlightenment thinkers was to combat such prejudices and to get people to think for themselves, to teach people to use their own reason instead of relying on others. The idea of this project was that if people thought for themselves, not only would they arrive at the truth more easily, but they would also become more tolerant and morally better people. The famous French writer Voltaire, who was one of the major figures of the Age of Enlightenment, summarized this view as follows. He writes, Superstition sets the whole world in flames. Philosophy quenches them. So we have in the thinking of the 18th century a distinction between superstition on the one hand and reason on the other. Superstitions change from one place to another and from one time to another. Our superstitions are different from those of people in Bangladesh or in Peru. And they are also different from those of people in the 17th century or the 7th century. But reason is always the same. If something is a reasonable argument for me, it is a reasonable argument for anyone, wherever they live, whenever they live. So the ideal of the Enlightenment is a thinker who can free himself from his own particular historical and geographical background, from his own prejudices, and who can thereby become truly reasonable. A truly reasonable person is a person who can, as it were, stand outside of history. Now this idea that we should try to escape from history 
in order to become rational, of course doesn't lead to a very high opinion of the study of history. It's not that the 18th century was against doing historical research. Voltaire himself, for instance, wrote historiography. Knowing about history might even help us to escape from the prejudices of the past. But an age that strives for an ideal of timeless rationality is not an age in which the study of history is seen as something especially important. This changed radically during the first half of the 19th century, an era that is often called the Romantic period or sometimes the age of history. For the Romantics, studying history became perhaps the most important intellectual activity of all. This big difference from the 18th century was possible because the Romantics, unlike the thinkers of the Enlightenment, did not believe in reason. Or perhaps we should say, they did believe in reason, but they did not believe that reason was the same for everyone. Now that was a very new idea. Throughout the history of Europe, thinkers had assumed that reason was universal, that every human being has it and that it is the same for everyone. Everyone who thought really well should be able to come up with the same true answers. That is what the romantic thinkers of the early 19th century denied. These thinkers believed something that most of us actually still believe. Namely, that the enlightenment ideal of stepping outside of history is impossible. They believe that everyone has been shaped by their own particular time and place, by their own culture, by their place in that culture. Someone who was born and raised in the Netherlands cannot think in the same way as someone who was born and raised in Japan. We can't think in the same way that medieval people thought. There is no neutral, rational way of thinking that is available to everyone. The Enlightenment thought of these differences between times and places as prejudices. But the Romantics invented a new word for this. Culture. An Enlightenment thinker might have talked about Dutch or German or Chinese prejudices. But in the 19th century people started talking about Dutch or German or Chinese culture. And unlike prejudices, which you need to get rid of, culture was of course thought of as something good. Being part of a culture is good. You shouldn't try to step outside of your own culture. You instead, you should learn as much as possible about it and then try to add to it and develop that culture. This new idea of culture had some very visible consequences. In politics, for instance, it coincided with the rise of nationalism. The idea that a state should consist of all people with the same culture. It is absolutely no coincidence that it was in the 19th century that both Germany and Italy, which used to consist of many small states, even though they were cultural unities, finally became unified countries. In intellectual life, perhaps the most important consequence was the great emphasis that was suddenly laid on the study of history as well as on some of the other humanities, such as art history and the study of folk literature. Studying history teaches you about your culture. And that means that it teaches you about yourself. You can only know yourself, the romantic thinker would say, if you know where you come from, if you know how you and your culture came to be the way they are. So, Studying history was not a minor academic discipline for a few specialists. No, it was a central concern of everyone who wanted to become a well-rounded person. Of everyone who was looking for, as the Germans would say, Bildung. 
And this meant that studying history became perhaps the most important academic activity of all. As we will see, this also led to entirely new theories about what understanding history actually means.